Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, I'm Andre Basso. I am part of the board of directors of IMDC and also the working group chair for the carrier technologies inside IMTC. And today I have the honor of uh, uh, moderating a very interesting uh, um, webinar about uh, metadata. Uh, metadata is, uh, is uh, an activity and an area that is emerging more and more for uh, important uh, um, media services. So in IMTC, uh, we, we thought it would be an interesting topic for um, you know, our, our own uh, activity. Um, I have with me a very prominent uh, person today that uh, will, be, will serve as a panelist. Uh, we have uh, Jean-Pierre Evan uh, from um, the European Broadcasting Union. Uh, we have uh, um, Alberto Messina from uh, the um, Resource Center of uh, the Italian Television. And we have uh, David Kim from AT&T Labs Research, uh, all very active in, uh, in metadata. So today we're going to discuss uh, mainly two areas. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, uh, metadata in the area uh, of uh, entertainment and the, the prominent role that is playing and what is happening in terms of standardization, what is uh, relevant for um, uh, interoperability. And, and then we're going to talk about uh, metadata for uh, video conference and telepresence, because that is also an area that is growing and is um, assuming an important, an important role. Um, so maybe the goal of of this MTC uh, uh, webinar is not only uh, to, to cover these, uh, these two areas, but also to give a sense of what the uh, what uh, um, ITC is doing in this uh, uh, in this uh, particular area, and as to foster some interest uh, from uh, from the, the audience. Uh, I want to give you a quick overview of what IMTC is and what are the key uh, activities. Um, we are a consortium of more than 30 market leaders in, uh, in the area of unified communication and multimedia content uh, development. And we work to create interoperable standard based products and to foster this activity. Um, it's a non profit organization. And uh, here in uh, you know, your screen, you see uh, some of the prominent uh, um, members of, uh, of, uh, of IMTC, and you see there are manufacturers, there are uh, service providers, um, there are <clears throat> network providers. So a pretty interesting and, uh, and um, uh, varied uh, uh, of members that, in fact, uh, can make the activities in IMTC very, very interesting, very, uh, very effective. Uh, our mission is really to focus in improving the customer experience and uh, to accelerate the market adoption of uh, contemporary and unified communication solution. And, uh, you know, we are strongly believer of uh, interoperability of products because the standard phase always is something that, uh, uh, that um, misses the, the, the feedback from the field, the feedback from the actual interoperability that, uh, uh, that um, um, you know, it's, it's the, the actual uh, test bed for, for the technology and, and the product. So it's where we are. Uh, we, we are this last step between the standard and the, the, the actual product, the actual uh, uh, deployment. Um, our goal and objectives are really to identify what are the obstacles to growth and success in the industry for, you know, these two areas, uh, so multimedia and uh, uh, unified communications, to really be the facilitator for the interoperability testing uh, and, and in fact we have all an apparatus for doing this and we do this on a regular basis and uh, uh, also we have strong liaison with uh, standardization bodies uh, where we provide requirements we provide feedback in fact for improvement of the standard so that uh, you know it becomes more usable more user friendly um, here, we, we really try to foster what, what are the common industry interests uh, through the education and 
promotion of uh, these activities, this webinar is actually part of, uh, of this activity. And also we are an impartial source of information uh, to end user, to the press, to uh, um, industry analyst, uh, legislator and regulator. We have a series of uh, collaborations with the patent offices. And, uh, and also we are really a forum for, you know, a meeting and exchanging uh, ideas. Uh, as I said, you ha we have a pretty extensive set of uh, um, liaisons with uh, key standardization bodies. Um, you know, IETF, you can recognize some of them here in the different areas, both on, on wired and, and wireless uh, um, network technologies, as well as uh, really content. Um, and uh, again, as I said, we have uh, specific events. I want to mention just uh, one that is the super op. It happens every year where we really focus in, uh, in getting all the possible components that uh, we are, um, you know, evaluating in, inside AMTC all together and, uh, and, uh, and interoperate. And here you have an example of what we call the super connect where uh, we, we connected a pretty large amount of different devices from different vendors uh, with the different service providers all together in a, in a um, video communication uh, uh, session. This is the session of, uh, of last year. Um, in terms of structure, there are these two main areas, the carrier technologies that I chair and the unified communications. Uh, and then the requirement education is what you know, I was mentioning uh, before. So in terms of the carrier technologies, the areas are in, in, the, in, the, in the domain of uh, streaming. So both on you know, wireless packet switch streaming uh, and also uh, you know, activities, more recent activities in uh, Dash for adaptive streaming. Metadata is an activity that we are uh, just uh, uh, starting now. Uh, we have an important activity in the area of uh, voice over LTE and uh, activities also in the uh, circuit-based uh, uh, video conferencing, wireless video conferencing uh, that goes under the standard of 3G uh, 324M. In the area of uh, unified uh, communications, the, uh, the activities are around, uh, of course, uh, telepresence and, uh, um, and then, you know, SBC that is the side of, uh, you know, of the video, uh, uh, video coding, video representation that is going to become very important, uh, you know, for the success of this kind of, of technologies. In the requirements and education, uh, you know, we have an important database uh, of uh, documents, in fact, and that, that, that is very useful uh, for, uh, uh, you know, um, patent offices and other entities that to have this kind of information uh, uh, access. Uh, uh, briefly, you know, the Carrier Technology Working Group, uh, the charter, it's, it's again fostering interoperability on, on key carrier technologies. And, uh, you know, I already mentioned the one that, uh, that we have identified. The, uh, the, in the area of metadata, we really believe that metadata would be, uh, you know, quite a king in the future because, uh, you know, after content is uh, metadata is what allow uh, user a service provider to optimize the service, to enhance the services, to create uh, new services that, uh, uh, you know, are much more descriptive, uh, uh, engage much more uh, the, uh, the, the audience, and, uh, um, and also uh, simplify the access, uh, the information that we want to access at a given instant in time. Uh, and so, uh, this is the reason why we, we, we thought that uh, this, uh, this webinar be a good forum for discussion on what, uh, what, what is the state of the art and what would be the next step in this in this area from an AMTC perspective. Uh, okay, said that, uh, I would say I, I, I pass the floor uh, to, uh, to Dave Gibbon that uh, will give you uh, an overview of uh, um, you know the current technologies that, that uh, allow generation of metadata in the area of uh, um, entertainment content. Uh, so Dave, uh, you you can also say a few words about you. Uh, okay, Andrea, thank you very much. Um, 
I will. Let me just get my presentation going. Um, one second. Um, this is an interesting panel, I think, of uh, the topic uh, in terms of metadata is something that we've worked on a lot, and it's, uh, yeah, I think it is very interesting, and even going forward, it will become more uh, critical, some of the developments that are going on um, on the Internet uh, with, you know, the movement away from physical media like DVDs and things like that. Um, so I'm pretty excited to be involved with that, and I'll cover a few topics, as Andrea pointed out. Um, let's see if I can get there. Um, so just to some background, a little bit about the group that uh, both uh, Andrea and I are actually in uh, does, uh, we just kind of have a shared uh, goal with many others of uh, developing uh, robust methods for extracting metadata from video content primarily. Um, and the goal would be then to enable a broad range of uh, services and applications. Um, you know, robust meaning that we you know, we realize there's probably error in, in to generate information about media, um, and so these automated methods may work in collaboration with manual annotation uh, methods as well uh, to generate uh, content descriptions that can do uh, interesting things like uh, be able to drive personalization. Um, or maybe finding content very specifically that uh, users are interested in out of a large um, archive of content or ever-growing, uh, you know, amount of material that's available. Um, and uh, we start to think about, you know, what is the state of the art of this? Well, we can look to the Internet maybe to see, you know, what startups are deploying this kind of technology or more to the academic community. Um, one place is... Um, is, that I like to think of is this uh, Trek Vid uh, conference. This is more, it's actually more of a, an evaluation that happens uh, annually, and its focus is on retrieval primarily. Uh, however, it really does uh, bring together a bunch of uh, research groups internationally that uh, are kind of focused on the problems of extracting information um, from media, uh, video primarily. And for mainly the task is retrieval, but certainly has other applications as well. So it's good to look at that to see what's what's happening in the state of the art. Um, it uh, there are, it's been going on for many years. Uh, they've had other tasks in the past, such as video segmentation. But the current tasks for 2012 are shown here. Um, semantic indexing. One can think of it as automatica tagging of content to try to give an, an image, uh, find, um, you know, what is in this? Is it, a, is it a image of a flag, for example? And this usually involves a set of classifiers that are trained on content uh, to then uh, try to generate tags automatically. Um, there's a bunch of other ones here. We don't have to go through all of them, but some of them are text-based where you're trying to find content given a textual description. Um, but the idea is not to do information retrieval in the text domain, but more in the video domain. Uh, there's some work in uh, surveillance, finding uh, interesting events in video. The events might be um, something like someone going through an airport and uh, doing something that's not uh, traditional, like leaving a package, you know, in one spot and then moving on or something. Uh, obviously, it's in that. Um, then, you know, there's uh, something that's more advanced in that, in that area, sort of this multimedia event where there's sort of a concept of bringing together several low-level classifiers. Say you want to find a uh, a cake or something like that, or uh, scoring a run in a, in a sports game. You have to understand that there's several things like uh, lower-level things such as um, you know, the crowd noise may be coming up, or there may be certain colors uh, in the image. Those are sort of lower-level components, but the idea is to extract a higher-level meaning from that. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting task. And then <clears throat> new this year is one about uh, kind of you, that, how do you present uh, evidence to somebody looking at the results of that to get some confidence in, in how that uh, system worked. So the idea is to generate some kind of information that a analyst can go through and see how did this system create this uh, multimedia event. Um, and they've migrated a little bit. In the past, they've done um, copy detection uh, based on the content, and we participated in that in our group here, where it was involved a lot of transformations uh, like blurring or 
uh, picture in picture, kind of degradations to video. So it's not just a direct duplicate detection, it's sort of called near duplicate or uh, copy detection. Um, but that's the kind of phased out this year. They, they, have, they aren't doing that. Um, but the trend is to go to larger data sets, internet and data sets as well. Um, at AT&T, we're focusing, um, you know, we focus a lot on broadcast media as, as a you know, source of content to develop algorithms and um, applications on. Uh, we're focusing a little more on user-generated content. Um, so things like, you know, in that case, structure, uh, not, uh, edited material, we love it. Um, and one has to focus more on things like face recognition, face detection, uh, those kinds of things to develop any kind of um, metadata that can be useful for users to organize their media. Um, we have also focused more recently on real-time media processing. And you'll hear more about uh, APDP coming up, but we certainly embrace that. And we think that's a great thing for representing the media uh, results that, that uh, are generated and hopefully that will lead to more interoperability among these type of systems. Um, and uh, we do have a couple of systems that try to do that in, in real time where we run media analysis and on a, in a web architecture, clients can connect and get uh, content descriptions in a standardized format. Um, so uh, this is just an example of some of the media processing that can be done. Um, this is almost like a configuration when we have a you know, a full set of image processing, media processing operations that take place for certain content, or maybe if we're doing it on a continuous basis, there's not enough, um, you know, resources available to do everything, like a lot of CPU, for example. So we may do some set of the processing. Um, so things like, you know, synchronization of media are difficult to do in real time, um, like our synchronization of like uh, closed captioning, which is you know, often done you know, manually, so that would involve introducing latency uh, in sort of the real-time application. So we may do that on batch processing as opposed to real-time. But we try to organize all these media processing elements here as uh, web services. Uh, we're sort of moving toward that. Um, some of them are fully developed, uh, you know, REST phase and JSON for representing the results. Uh, where one might just media to a service and retrieve the results. And so we're um, sort of in the process of migrating toward that market in general. Um, there in the past, the traditional workflow architectures, service-oriented architectures, where a piece of content may kind of go through selected uh, media processing application or operations, depending on the need of that particular you know, application. Um, and this is certainly just a, a list. There may be more uh, other different uh, elements that can be done for you know, different uh, applications as well. And some of these apply more towards um, broadcast content versus um, you know, user-generated content. Um, so like, I don't think I mentioned here closed captioning or things. Like I guess I have text processing, which we might you know, apply more toward uh, annotated content or content with subtitles as opposed to other types of content. Um, so just moving along, this is kind of an example of um, bringing in some of the results and representing this on a timeline of a particular asset that's been processed. We may have uh, you know, indications of where the shot boundaries are, uh, the speaker turns where one speaker finishes and another speaker starts up, um, and some information about topic segmentation. If it's a news program, we can say, well, this is one story, and then after that, we have another story. Uh, and that helps, of course, with retrieval um, and personalization of material. So this is just one way to kind of represent it. Uh, what we're actually showing here, too, is um, bringing in um, results from uh, audience measurement. So in this case, it was a broadcast content, and uh, we're able to look at events where people tuned away from the content for different reasons, change the channel essentially. Um, and that's what this indicated on the bottom there. So that's some of the newer work that we've basically trying to incorporate that and look for what is it in the media that's causing people to turn away, tune away and change the channel. And of course, if there's a commercial and advertisement in the content, that's a, the point where many people turn tune away. Um, that's fairly well understood. 
when, but what about when there's a change of topic in the, in the news program? Uh, we actually can detect some of those events, and that's actually what's shown in this first segment here. There's, there's a, the, around five minutes in the time scale, we see a, a large number of tuned and they move to the topic that was displayed. So it's just a way of showing how media analysis can help explain some of the behavior that we're seeing out there uh, as people consume content. Um, this is another interface where we've got that and sort of a, a real-time uh, cursor can display the location and kind of you can analyze, you know, what was happening in the media at that time. Uh, so it's a kind of a user interface tool. Uh, I guess I don't want to take too much more time here, so I'm going to move toward the, um, the work in Addis. So we sort of wear a couple of different hats here, and this is more in the standardization area of metadata. Um, this, and Addis, if you're not familiar, is sort of a North American standards body for telecommunications companies. Um, and they've, uh, there's a group uh, that's focused on IPTV interoperability. Uh, within that, there are some committees, and I'm involved in the metadata committee. Um, however, there's a slight reorganization of things, and I'll mention that in a minute. Um, but the idea is to kind of, you know, support interoperability for the whole the stakeholders, which would be content creators, service providers of um, television service, uh, or and network providers, um, and so. Uh, there's been a set of standards, and the idea is to kind of, you know, pull from a lot of the good work that's been done already and try to not create new new uh, standards where they're not necessary. But sometimes we have to adapt things to meet uh, requirements like FCC requirements uh, that are unique to um, the U.S. Uh, market. Um, so uh, recently, in fact, yesterday, a couple of issues reached uh, final closure. Um, one that was I was working on that was called uh, Internet Sourced Content. When it reached final closure, it ended up being called something a little different, some content on demand uh, metadata, um, and sort of a follow-on to that. There, in the past, uh, there was work on content on demand, and the thought was to extend this to other non-traditional sources of, of content that might be Internet-based. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about what that meant. Does that mean over the top? And then what, and how does that fit into Addis? Because the, the role, the definition of how we scoped the work was that this was a managed IPTV service. And of course, over the top video is sort of the you know, unmanaged network. Um, so there were some hybrid models defined about ingesting the content from the internet uh, first and then staging it in the managed network. So it's sort of a hybrid solution. But anyway, there's more detail than you need to know. Um, so that one has reached closure. Uh, there's also some uh, work on uh, quality of service metrics that's uh, reached closure um, for video on demand or content on demand. Um, and uh, more just about a month ago, they changed the scope a little bit and the emphasis was um, less on creating full-blown end-to-end standards and more on creating solutions, uh, kind of defining profiles, if you will, of, of pulling things from existing uh, standards more. So it's, you know, they sort of completed a bunch of work on offering the basic uh, capabilities and then uh, in terms of television service, and now it's more toward uh, seeing how the business needs evolve. So there's a slight difference in the scope. Um, it's kind of potentially moving away from this managed versus unmanaged environment that I just mentioned. Um, so it's broader in some cases and narrower, narrower in some others. Um, and just a technical thing, they've basically moved away from uh, committees more toward task forces to be more mobile to different or more adaptable to changing business needs. Uh, I think of my last slide is just the, the mission statement that's been revised. So I'm not going to read that, but uh, if you'd like, you can take a look at that. Um, and this is this is where I'll end it. Um, so it's uh, you know hopefully we'll get a chance to discuss more later on in the in the session. Uh, and if you have any questions, I can entertain them. I guess at, at that point, uh, or you know certainly if anything comes to mind, I can entertain them now as well. Um, so with that, I guess I'll hand it back to Andrea.
Yeah, thank you, Dave. Uh, actually, just one one uh, one simple question uh, for for our audience. Uh, um, you know, we we are trying to really um, show uh, how metadata is important uh, for uh, for the new generation of services. Can can you just elaborate uh, very quickly with few words? on you know what is the potential of metadata because on one side you know we have all these analysis technologies that are becoming uh, usable uh, because processing power is higher because we have cloud services and things like that uh, can you just give a, a a quick glance to uh, uh, to our audience on what are the amazing thing that you can do once you have uh, uh, once you have metadata so descriptors about the content available yeah, that's. A, I mean, it's a very good question. It's something we spend a lot of time figuring out, is, you know, because it's fun to try to create algorithms that extract the data. Sort of what we'd like to do to do is figure out how we can create services, you know, revenue generating services or applications that users will want to pay for, essentially, to kind of uh, utilize a lot of these interesting things that we work on. Um, and it really depends on where what market you're looking at. So. The one that we, that the Addis was talking about, or that the TrekVid was focused on, I mentioned was sort of the sort of security application, right? So you have thousands of videos, right. hours of, of video material, and what's of interest there? Obviously, you need to develop automated tools, extract metadata, and then have analysis that works on the metadata to kind of generate events, for example. Um, in the case of user generated content, well, what kind of structure do we have? We have just uh, kind of images of people outside, and so we, all, all we can do is extract maybe locations of faces and kind of assist in the tagging. Um, of course, these have to be folded into an application that a user wants to use that has a social aspect where they can kind of tag the content as well. So in that case, we have there's no problem now creating content, delivering content, you know, over wireless or right. you know. Dash, we have we have a lot of capabilities to do that. So the problem becomes, uh, how do we get to the content that we want? How do we kind of reuse it, uh, make it, you know, surface the material so that people can find what they're looking for, um, and then, you know, kind of precisely get to where they want and give their feedback to it. So I think to me, there's just the content descriptions that we've that I've been talking about primarily, but then that should be augmented with um, the social aspect of recommendations and. Uh, the usage metrics that come in to help monetize the content. So, you know, create the targeted right. advertising and then see who's actually looking at that material so we can kind of get a value to it. Yeah, but yeah it's a long answer. No, I think, yeah, the, aspects. Right. You know, in fact, there are several axes, I would say, from analytics uh, to uh, the repurposing of the content simply because, uh, you know, you can have existing right. content now that uh, you, you have the script or you, you have. Uh, uh, different ways of combining it uh, together, and, and then, as, as Dave was mentioning, the access aspect. You, you can really speed up the access, reduce the search time uh, for the content that uh, that you want to see at that particular instant in time. Okay, Dave, thank you very much. Okay, Dave, and uh, yeah. we're gonna move to uh, Jean-Pierre Evan uh, from the European Broadcasting Union. It's a pleasure to have you here, Jean-Pierre. Uh, Jean-Pierre is very famous, Welcome. one of the fathers of uh, TV Anywhere. And uh, Jean-Pierre, I leave you the floor. And any, if you want anytime, to any words time. about you. Anytime, anytime. Absolutely, sorry. Okay, uh, Alberto, do you want to uh, to uh, maybe do your presentation, and uh, and then we'll get uh, we'll get back to uh, to Jean-Pierre. Okay, okay. So I, I leave you the floor. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, can you see the first slide? Yes. Okay. I will give you a short introduction to <clears throat> the visual description profile, which is also known as ISO IEC <clears throat> Amendment 1 of the famous uh, MPEG-7 uh, profile document, <clears throat> but it's be also known as the MPEG-7 AVDP profile or the EBU MPEG-7 profile or whatever you might want to call it. Uh, yeah, I'm, by the way, I'm Alberto Messina from, <clears throat> from the RAI Research Center, which is the Italian public broadcasting and I'm coordinating the area concerning multimedia information engineering here at the lab. 
uh, so why why we identified a need for a new MPEG-7 profile? Probably many of you uh, already know that uh, MPEG-7 uh, already came with a number of profiles. Here, the, the labels of these profiles are exemplified, like, for example, user description profile, simple media profile, uh, core description profile. Well, basically, they were insufficient for a number of reasons. Mainly for, uh, the main reason was that uh, no one from the existing profiles included uh, part three and four of MPEG-7. That were the, uh, the parts that were specifically uh, containing uh, descriptors about audio and video uh, metadata. So it, it, it seems like a strange choice from, from the original MPEG-7 uh, authors not to provide uh, a profile which was uh, already including such a complexity, perhaps because uh, at those times uh, the, there was any specific need for this, uh, to, to include these, these uh, complex descriptors. But uh, when we started the analysis in the EBU, it was the time in which uh, uh, the Sky project in EBU, I was, I was chair of the project at the time we decided to, to go at 2MPEG with the AVDP, uh, is that uh, we identified a number of cases uh, for which uh, uh, the usage of, of automatic information extraction techniques were already viable. Uh, so that's, that's the reason for which we, we started the start standardizing a new profile so that we could have a strategic advantage in having a standard already in advance of, of, I mean, of the engineered applications to come. So the origin, as I said, uh, was in EBU and was born in the context of the technical group uh, uh, Sky, a study group of content analysis information extraction. And uh, we developed uh, a set of requirements having in mind uh, a pool of target application. So the starting point was uh, selecting, identifying, and describing the requirements of, us, of, of reference applications. This is the list of applications that we uh, identified in, back in 2008, basically. And they were ranging from content summarization to text recognition from video semantic and structural segmentation, copy repetition, very important, of course, personality identification, uh, both in voice and in video, keywords extraction, and subject classification. These, these subject areas were analyzed and requirements were, were, were drawn out of this analysis uh, so that we could, um, we could uh, propose um, to MPEG um, the standardization process for AVDP. Well, we didn't start from scratch, actually, because there, was, there were already a couple of attempts that were, had been already uh, put in place by other organizations. I think that we have uh, the main one were, the main ones were uh, from UNM Research, detailed audiovisual profile. Uh, which was in the same in the same trail than AVDP, but using a different set of tools and with a different, let's say, conceptualization. And uh, the NHK, the Japan National Broadcasting Company, a metadata production framework, uh, which were which were already addressing uh, several part of the requirements that we we were focusing on in the EBU. So out of these uh, out of these analysis, uh, we started the process. And so we proposed to MPEG to to have this new amendment in uh, July 2010. So we went through the standardization process during the course of 2011. And so we passed from the, the, the proposed draft amendment to the draft amendment and to the final draft amendment that was uh, uh, finally accepted last April 23rd. So now AVDP is official, is an official standard. So it is, it is part of the, of the standard asset uh, of ISO. Uh, well, currently, to, to complete the work, what is still missing is the amendment of Part 11 of MPEG-7, which is the XML schema. But uh, this, this is now it's in, in, in the final stages, too. To, so whomever has got access to the draft of the schema, uh, basically 100% uh, is already considering the final one, unless something very, very strange will happen in the next weeks, but I don't expect it. So Part 9, the profile is already standard. Part 11 will follow in a few weeks. So this is just uh, an example of, of the general requirements that, that we identified in the, in the original EBU work. And so, as you can see, I'm not going to read, of course, but uh, this is just an example of how the process went. So uh, we listed uh, very, very, in a very compact and in a very precise way 
all the requirements that were that were uh, have been identified. So you, Andrea, also were were part of this of this work. I remember uh, connecting through WebEx is most of the time and commenting uh, over our analysis. So uh, uh, this was a, this was a, a big a big effort, but um, but I think that. Uh, the essence and the importance of, of this effort has been immediately caught by, by the MPEG people because they, they embraced our, our proposal quite happily and we, they supported us in all the process, uh, in also in identifying possible uh, possible way to enrich the standard, for example, by providing examples in the annex of the, of the, of the amendment and providing also an extension of the MPEG-7 experimentation model who was, uh, which is now currently including also a very simple example of, of how to map uh, an existing profile to an, an AVDP so that everyone who has got access to the standard has already a, a, refer a reference piece of software with which to play. So this is a chart which is illustrating very briefly which is the semantics of AVDP. So uh, AVDP is based on a very simple concept. We are interested in multimedia content, which is audiovisual, of course. Uh, and the top level segment, that is the audiovisual segment, can be decomposed temporally. So uh, the, main tool, uh, the main tool of the AVDP is the temporal decomposition of content. And temporal decomposition of content can be, carried, uh, can be uh, realized through different, through, uh, using different criteria. For example, shot detection or automatic speech recognition, sentence-based uh, segmentation, or another criteria could be the technical detection of faces and so on. But the key objective is try to, uh, to represent uh, the, the, all the possible um, segmentation approaches at content uh, in, a, in, a, in a unified way so that also tools that, uh, that base uh, their performance on the combination of, uh, of, of uh, results of, different, of, of other tools have a direct and straightforward, straightforward mechanism to, uh, to access uh, the results and to combine these results in new knowledge. And for each of the segments that you can uh, identify in the, in the uh, temporal decomposition, uh, of course, you can attach all the descriptors that uh, have been included out of part three and part four of MPEG-7. So uh, this, in, in very simple, in very, in very, in very simple words, is, is summarizing the powerfulness of AVDP. So in a, in a single standard, the possibility to structure and to describe content in a very detailed manner. So this is just an implementation example. Uh, as maybe uh, Andrea has already mentioned, uh, we, we have been active in the, in the field of, of uh, automated metadata uh, generation and enrichment since the early 2000s. So it is already 10 years experience that we have in uh, producing systems and technologies for automated indexing of content, specifically for news, which is a, which is an easy, let's say, you know, an easy domain for several, from several point of views. And uh, so this is, this is just an example of the kind of uh, information entities that can be, uh, actually can be cu currently mapped on IVDP. So you c it can range from the spoken content transcription to, uh, uh, of course, to the uh, categorization and to ap application of labels, of standard labels, of categories, to uh, segments of the content. Uh, of course, uh, uh, detection and description of new stories in the timeline, as well as also other, other segmentation, for example, uh, the visual shot-wise uh, segmentation. So uh, all the information that is typically uh, extra extractable from the analysis of content from by platforms like this one or like the one uh, we, we learned about uh, in the presentation from David are, are natively, I would say, are natively um, representable in IVDP. Um, so uh, this, I think this paves the way for a lot of applications, uh, both in the, in, the, in the area of exchange of these data between platforms and also in the, in the, in the area of uh, uh, development of services for, uh, for accessing content based on, on, standard, on standard queries, for example. So let's, let me draw a few conclusions. So AVDP is the new standard reference for low-level automatically structured metadata. And I would also say for uh, not just for, for low-level metadata, but also for structuring content. So uh, it is grounded on the thorough requirement analysis that was done by the EBU expert back a couple of years ago, even more than that. And we can already foresee a couple of strategic impacts 
on one side uh, in the EBU members' internal project as well as in all the other uh, in all the other industry partners that are interested in this in this area because of course AVDP is an ISO is an ISO standard and as well as in FIMS uh, which is uh, this initiative which is backed by uh, by ANVA and EBU uh, which is a framework for interoperable media services uh, in, in which AVDP I, I think I guess will 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 play a central role as well. Uh, as I said, the XML schema of AWDP is going to be standardized soon, uh, but 100% will be already will be the one which is uh, which is draft currently. And uh, another news is that guidelines are being prepared by the the, the originating group of AVDP, the MIMA Sky Group, about the usage of AV, of AVDP. Uh, so stay tuned about this because they, these guidelines will be uh, will be scheduled by um, to be issued in 2012. So I cannot finish my presentation without giving some acknowledgments because I think that uh, uh, Mazanori, Mazasano from H NHK was really a key person in developing IVDP with, for his excellent skills and knowledge of the MPEG procedural rules, which are not always easy to understand, I must say, and for his continued passion for the IVDP and, of course, for, for, for his very nice character. Jean-Pierre Evan, who's also present in this webinar for, for the continued support in EBU technical to the VDP, also because he co-chaired the MPEG HG with Maza, and for the continuous dissemination and support of AVDP uh, throughout, throughout the world and throughout all the projects that are concerned with metadata extraction. And also Werner Beiler from UNM Research for his top-level expertise in MPEG 7. And as a final statement, all the Sky, all the Sky members for having supported AVDP in its infancy and in its development in EBU, uh, Andrea included, because he was one of the, of the contributors. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. This is my email address. If you, in case you want to contact me for many other details, I didn't have the time to show you today. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, let's see if, uh, if actually Jean-Pierre is uh, it's online. Uh, Jean-Pierre, can, can you hear us? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, perfect. And can so you I hear me? To ask, uh, yes, I can hear you well. well yeah, if you don't can worry, show I, my slides, that would help. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, here we go. You should, uh, we should have you soon. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I have, uh, I have your slides. Okay, it's not yet on my screen. We are, it's, it's on slide two. All right. So I cannot see anything, so I'm going to do the blind test. Okay, yeah, and you can I'm use going a to run it from copy. my own. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, if, if, if it wants to show up. I, this is, yeah. All right. The Scopia application is creating a terrible mess on my PC for some reason. Um, okay, I'm almost there. All right, so let me try the, uh, to, to make the presentation from the EBU perspective. Uh, so maybe some of you don't know what the EBU is. The EBU is the European Broadcasting Union, and it is the largest uh, professional application of uh, a professional association of uh, broadcasters in the world, with uh, active members in Europe and uh, associate members everywhere in the world. We have got offices in the, on the different continents, except in Australia, and uh, we also operate the Eurovision News and Sport Network. Um, okay. okay. So um, here we are here today to speak about the metadata activities of the EBU, and uh, this is a very long story. So I'm, I'm now regularly using that slide because that's showing the evolution of metadata. And if, in fact, we we started really from the beginning, and we started by we started by doing some control vocabularies like the one called escort which was trying to define some genres and some uh, uh, distribution uh, cases, et cetera, et cetera. And then we moved into uh, 
more complex uh, definitions of concepts and then we moved into XML and uh, now we are into the RDF and also really frankly we are following that curves we are following all these different evolutions of metadata and we are present in all these segments and we have been there from the very beginning so I think we understand very well what metadata is what it is for and what it's going to be used for in the future and uh, I will also refer to TV in time and other things that we have done. Uh, this is uh, on the slide three. You should have different squares showing the metadata activities. And here you can see where the yeah. EBU is involved in terms of um, metadata projects. So we have the EBU projects themselves, which are the uh, media information management projects with uh, acquisition metadata, but I come back to that, um, metadata models, etc. We also work in collaboration with my colleagues from the uh, Eurovision network because they exchange metadata with uh, different EBU members when they send the news items or the sport events on the different uh, receivers that our members have at their own premises. Um, we are working with our members looking at their developments, what they are doing. We are trying to meet their requirements. We are doing, doing a lot of work with uh, different communities like uh, the ac academic community or different developers. And we have even set up the metadata developer network. So we try to have um, to share experience and views with as many experts as possible. Uh, we set up different conferences. We try to do webinars like today. We have the website where you can find a lot of information on our activities. We have a workspace with, where people who are in our groups uh, can see and share the documents and see the activities as they develop. And uh, actually, it is, I think, the right point to say that uh, our groups, except one, are all open to everyone who is interested to join. And you can find the link to uh, these groups from the uh, tech.ebu.ch website. And we develop so all sorts of reports and recommendations. We develop technical specifications. We are uh, in engaged in many uh, organizations. So you, you showed the organi organizations with which uh, IMTC uh, has linked with. But uh, we also have the same sort of link with uh, the AES for the Audio Engineering Society, AMWA, which is a group of uh, uh, an industrial um, consortium in the U.S. that is developing different specifications, like, for instance, profiles for MXF, uh, DVB in Europe, which is very strong, and beyond Europe as well. ECTA, which is a group of organizations working on the on advertising and the exchange of advertising content. LC, which is doing all the standards for uh, uh, broadcasting in particular, because there is the broadcast committee that is chaired by EBU in LC. IPTC because of news MLG2, MPEG of course, SMPT, you know that very well in the US, TrekVid because of the activities in Sky, and also a lot of work with W3C. And we are also involved in two European projects, and uh, some of them which are really key to us are EU Screen and Europeana, then Presto Express and Presto and Presto Prime are now finished, and the YouTube, YouTube is also finished now. So you can move to the next slide, which are the different projects in metadata information management, yeah. which is a group chaired by Alberto. It is co-chaired by Alberto from RAI and by uh, Johan Hoffman from VRT, the Belgian Flemish broadcaster. Uh, in these groups, uh, except, except the meme group itself, which is reserved for EBU members, but all the other groups are open, as I said, and you can find EBU members, you can find manufacturers, you can find students, you can find all, all people from the academic community, you can find developers, you can find whoever is interested in metadata. We try to share with as many people as we can. The different projects in MIME are um, the project MM for modeling of metadata and metadata. That's where we develop all sorts of things like the class conceptual data model, which is an ontology uh, covering everything from uh, commissioning to uh, delivery. And we, that's where we also develop all sorts of metadata specifications and the flagship is easy. And that's also where we work on semantic web. Sky is a group that is related to what Alberto just mentioned, which is AVDP. So the discussion started there. We had very ambitious plans about testing different sorts of tools, and, but uh, we have never really been able of doing that sort of test. Also, I am now working with my colleague from Eurovision, and they are looking at that sort of tools and 
they wish we would have done that sort of evaluation, but it is very, very difficult to set up, and you probably know that from all the experience in the past in TrekVid and other similar groups. Then we have the AM project, which is about acquisition metadata. Here we have been working in very close collaboration with Sony and Panasonic, and uh, we are so special. Uh, we are specifying all the metadata that is generated by uh, camcorders or, or, or cameras, and uh, so th this specification is really based on some metadata from Sony and Panasonic. But we want to extend what they have done by working on the representation serialization of this metadata using XML and possibly JSON. Um, there are many different options. As soon as you can do it in XML, then you can you, you can do it in many different formats. Then we have the Metadata Developer Network, which task is uh, to organize workshops, hands-on workshops, where people can come and share knowledge and show people how to use their tools. And then we have the DFXP project on time text, and I can tell you that for the time being, this is a, a very active group because it has a lot of ramification and uh, and uh, connections with uh, groups like W3C, SMPTE, and uh, MPEG. So I can tell you this is a very active group, and for the time being, they are changing the charter in W3C, and uh, I am in the middle of uh, the exchange of many emails. And FIMS, FIMS is a big project, a collaboration between the EBU and the AMWA, and uh, we have big players there. We have uh, IBM, Sony, we have big users like HBO, Bloomberg, etc., etc. and for the time being, the EBU that is changing its own MAM for the Eurovision is uh, discussing with Dalet for the implementation of FIMS. So this is a very important project for us. Now we can go to the next slide. So certainly something that is important for EBU is the EBU core, which we call the Dublin core for media. Why do we say that? Because uh, it is completely based on Dublin core for many different reasons, but I, I won't take the time of going through all these details now, but uh, we decided to base everything on Dublin core. And we extend Dublin core on a few occasions, but also we we formalize some of the elements from Dublin Core. So those who are familiar with metadata know that the format element, for instance, in Dublin Core um, can do nothing good for uh, audiovisual content unless you do uh, something more in terms of refining its definition and structuring the data that goes into the format element. And that's what we have done in EBU Core. Uh, for, uh, yes, EBU Core is uh, very important because it is used in EU Screen. EU Screen is a European portal for archives, and EU Screen is also communicating and exchanging metadata with Europeana, which is the European Digital Library. And EU Screen, as a project, is using EBU Core as its as its core format for metadata. And uh, in fact, the metadata that is exchanged with Europeana is the RDF form of EBU Core. And so they do EBU core RDF plus associated linked open data. So that's a, that's a key development. Uh, Presto Prime has, a, has a done an evaluation of EBU core, and that was a positive evaluation from what we heard. So we were very happy with that. Um, but EBU core is not restricted to archives, and uh, we are doing a lot of work, as I said, on RDF and all. I'm, I'm collaborating with W3C on all these different aspects. Um, actually, the media annotation ontology Emma Ont from W3C is now a subset of EBU core because when we developed Emma Ont, we have come together and made uh, some. We have made some decisions in terms of um, uh, how to represent this information in RDF, and this has been also replicated into EBU core. RDF. Uh, EBU Core is used in films for SOA, and uh, interestingly enough, I saw that the technical metadata, which is relatively relatively complex, would be uh, would be uh, adopted last, and in fact, it was adopted first, and, uh, and then we adopted the descriptive metadata that goes with it, and the Engineering Society, Audio Engineering Society, has republished EBU Core as AES 60. And uh, MediaCorp also has adopted ABU Core, and uh, they called it SMM Core, but it is actually ABU Core. And Bloomberg in the US is also using ABU Core through, through its uh, own implementation of themes. And of course, ABU Core, in, in addition to RDF and all, is available in XML, in JSON, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we we are developing many tools, and I, I still have plans to do tools for. Um, 
iPad and other things like this to help people adopting it. And we have also in a beta testing a mapping tool for EBU Core. We go to the next slide and which is about Ectameta. So rapidly, Ectameta is an extension of EBU Core, which is about um, describing advertising content for uh, what the French call dematerialization. That is a file exchange of uh, advertising content between sales houses and, um, and the broadcasters who are going to broadcast this advertising content. Next slide. Okay, we have another couple of minutes. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll go very fast. Uh, news, uh, news MLG2 is extremely important for us for Eurovision, and uh, that's why we are spending a lot of time in IPTC, and we are implementing News MLG2 very strongly. That's, uh, that's also used for exchange with our members. Next slide is this acquisition metadata, as, 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 I, as I described, which is the uh, metadata coming from the different camcorders. So for the time being, the technical metadata is defined in very much detail, but now we need to work on the serialization of this data and also on additional descriptive metadata. Next slide. The class conceptual data model, actually on this one, uh, this is really an ontology. We have had a lot of feedback and it's very promising. So watch that space. Uh, CCDM is something that's going to evolve certainly in the future. And um, I, we have had very, very positive signs of people willing to use this. So it's an interesting way of uh, describing con um, of describing production and broadcasting facilities from commissioning to delivery. Next slide, all the other projects in which we are involved. So as I said, conceptual data model, the EU Scan Europeana, TV Anytime. So I am the person who is responsible for the maintenance of TV Anytime in Etsy. So anytime that somebody, anytime that's the right case to say that, when somebody wants to change it, they have to come through me and then I send this information on the different reflectors of TV Anytime to make sure that the community is aware of the proposed changes. Then we go through a very precise process from Etsy and then we republish a new version of the specification and everything can be found on the tech.ebu.ch slash anytime tv anytime pages including information on the patents which are absolutely not essential so you can really uh, relatively freely implement tv anytime and i guess some people in atis would be very interested to look at this information now uh, themes, as we said, very important, RDF all, and let's not forget all the control vocabularies. Uh, we have a lot of resources on uh, some of our links, which I have provided on the next slide. And this is important because we have it in XML, but we also have it in RDF scores. So I wanted to, um, to uh, give the floor to Alberto, but Alberto spoke before me, and I move to the next slide, which is my last slide and where you find all sorts of links. So if you need to go there, if you want to navigate and enjoy reading all these things about metadata or reusing some of the material which is there, everything is uh, freely available. So you can use it, you can explore it, you can play with it, you can also feedback whatever you think about uh, this. And very soon after we have finished the beta testing um, period of the uh, uh, mapping tools and the mapping software is going to be in to be made available to the public one of the, through one of the pages of the tech.tbu.ch website. Uh, that's about it. Uh, if you have any questions, and I'm happy to answer your questions now. Jean-Pierre, thank you very much for this uh, for this overview. That is very thorough, very very comprehensive, uh, and uh, give a sense of, uh, to our audience on uh, how much activity. Uh, not only in Europe, but also here in the US, uh, you know, we, we saw on, on, on metadata. So it is really an activity that, uh, that probably will be prominent in the area of, uh, you know, content and, and content access. Um, so thank you, Jean-Pierre. Uh, we gonna Here move we now to a presentation. Uh, to a, to a presentation uh, about uh, metadata uh, specific uh, uh, on uh, um, video conferencing, and uh, we're going to cover this topic. Uh, um, uh, we cover this topic together with uh, with Dave Gibbon. So, I'm going to switch presentation. Um, and uh, and move uh, to. Uh,
to the conferencing uh, topic. Uh, uh, okay, so I, I think that uh, you, you can see the slides. Okay, so, um, you know, it, content is evolving a lot uh, in terms of, you know, access in terms of uh, uh, management, uh, reorganization for, for me, me reasons. And also there are a lot of business reasons behind, behind the push of uh, new and uh, innovative uh, uh, services. But uh, there is no reason why another form of content that is generated, uh, you know, daily, Companies or in events like this, uh, that don't have to to benefit uh, from uh, from the fact of you know having deep descriptors that allow the organization a better access. And so you know uh, what we want to cover here together with Dave Gibbon is uh, some of the uh, thoughts and the you know requirements that uh, uh, telepresence uh, content, uh, video conferencing content has, and how you know it can generate a variety of uh, New and uh, and enhanced uh, uh, services. Um, uh, I'm just checking if you actually see the slides properly. Uh, it should be. It should be. Uh, let me just quickly do this. Again, yeah, okay. Now I should be able to see it. Okay, perfect. So, uh, Dave, uh, we, we, we can do this uh, together. Uh, yesterday we had a very interesting uh, discussion about uh, about this and how you know uh, telepresence services can really benefit from 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 these uh, uh, metadata. Um, here you see a list of, of thoughts that, that we had in, in discussion that we had say, inside our uh, working groups about uh, uh, you know how the residence experience can be uh, enhanced. And um, you know, uh, definitely uh, being able to have a, a pretty, pretty precise descriptors of, of the content that is in front of us allow to uh, um, generate automatic suggestion or you can associate the personalized relevant uh, content. David, you, you were mentioning yesterday about uh, the uh, mild device. Okay. Yes, uh, you broke up right toward the end there, but um, yeah, we think in terms of uh, the emergence of tablet devices and their capabilities, uh, you know, uh, working either as mobile endpoints in a telic presence kind of environment or as uh, additional screens, additional surfaces to complement the experience. Uh, and with metadata extraction, we can do things like put associated content on that uh, device. Um, there's uh, the notion of kind of uh, increasing the engagement um, in the conference. Uh, one of the problems we all experience is that, uh, you know, you're distracted by other information or other tasks while at a conference because parts of it are not maybe relevant to your particular area of an expertise. Uh, so we think that developing uh, information extraction techniques to at least give a rough idea of what's going on during the conference can do things like alert uh, participants to kind of focus at a certain point, participate at just the point that's of interest to, to their you know particular needs. Uh, as well as, you know, suggestions of uh, associated content from other sources that might be relevant to the material. And that should also be personalized so that uh, if someone is an expert in a particular area, they don't need to be informed about what a particular acronym might mean, whereas somebody who's new to the material may like a little background. Can material can that that can that yes. Right. Right, right. And, uh, you know, who doesn't want uh, to, to have, uh, uh, you know, an assistant for generating meeting minutes? Uh, I think this is a, is a task that, uh, you know, uh, any, any one of us, uh, you know, had to experience more than once. And, uh, and in fact, in that 
Monaco they can definitely help uh, help uh, in in into that. Uh, moving to the the, uh, the the next slide, many we see two key areas uh, for uh, you know for telepresence like content uh, um, and and metadata. So the scenario in which uh, uh, you know the teleconference or the the telepresence is going uh, uh, is going on, so it's live, and there is a way of generating real time metadata. Uh, from the content uh, itself, so it's it's, it's a one pass uh, uh, set of arguments get uh, get uh, get applied, and uh, it's in support of uh, uh, you know what is going on. So it's just giving a structure on what's been done up to now, and and allow to give a status in fact of uh, uh, you know what is going on during during the, the teleconference. You know, we came up with this. So dynamic summarization. It's, uh, uh, actually, they've had a, an interesting point on uh, on an analogy with the sports event, right, Dave? Right. I mean, we're seeing a lot of uh, metadata, you know, being generated to, for sports events just because there's a high uh, value to that in terms of you know what the people will, are willing to pay for in terms of accessing the content. Um, so for that, you know, there, there's a lot of manual annotation that goes on. Uh, and users can have access to metadata streams while, you know, sporting events are going on. Um, and, and, you know, in some cases they can use that as an entertainment uh, source themselves, even if they don't have access to the actual, you know, video media. Um, now, we'd like to take some of the positive aspects of that into a more broader application area of conferences where if we don't have the uh, ability typically to have somebody manually annotating what's happening in the conference. It's a luxury if we can afford that. That's great. But in most cases, uh, we don't have that. So how do we kind of get some similar capabilities like that uh, in a teleconference that maybe doesn't have as much structure? There's primarily the audio track has the most uh, information. So we can do some keyword detection, uh, those kinds of things, and try to summarize the content uh, and get a stream of metadata. So users can use that uh, during the conference. If they join late, for example, they may like to know, you know, what topics have already been presented, uh, you know, in this conference before I've joined. So we don't have to repeat those um, and get kind of a sort of a summary that's happening while the uh, teleconference may be in session. Uh, I think we can talk about, again, how those can be used offline as well. Right, and also you know some of, some of the features that are relevant in in teleconference, given that is uh, you know is uh, by direction um, are not the, the typical one that that you get in entertainment content. So extraction of all the non-verbal uh, um, communication aspects, you know, expression of of the faces, uh, the gestures, and and so on, are not uh, uh, not easy to um, uh, to detect and uh, and uh, and identify. So this is definitely a challenge of uh, you know an online access or real time processing of of this metadata, where you know the computational aspect is somehow constrained by by the time in which this metadata need, need to be available. But there are activities in, in, in this area that are promising. So, in, you know, once the algorithms uh, are available in this space, uh, we'll be able to generate the metadata that definitely will, will be an announcement of uh, the online access to, uh, to the content. Now, uh, moving to the uh, offline access and, and, and and consumption. Here we can apply more traditional uh, technologies of, of indexing, right, right, Dave? Yes, that's correct. I mean, we, you can view this as another media source, uh, although it's going to have different characteristics from the traditional broadcast news, which many people have focused on in the past because of its rich, you know, structure that's inherent in it. Um, with with this type of content. There's uh, less you know, to visual cues to go on uh, in terms of, uh, set, for example, set, creating a set of thumbnails for users to look at to kind of get a quick visual overview of what happened is very difficult in this context. Of course, we do have uh, multiple streams of uh, media in some cases to process, and they may be 
uh, segmented out. So that's an advantage where there's fewer background, uh, you know, obstructions to the audio because you actually may have a separate audio stream for each participant. Um, and the quality, you know, in the past hasn't been that great, but uh, today with telepresence solutions, um, the audio quality is getting to be much better. And of course, the video quality is getting better as well. So a lot of the um, algorithms, you know, have at least cleaner data to operate on. Um, been, it, there's still uh, some of the techniques that have been developed in terms of speech uh, to text to create uh, keywords uh, are improving, uh, you know, kind of very quickly these days. It's still, it's still a challenge with uh, people who are not professional speakers, uh, you know, like announcers, and also these right. very domain-specific right. vocabularies that we find in, in uh, meetings. Right, right. And uh, so, you know, to just close uh, this uh, this brief overview, uh, you know, that there are a uh, you know, lot of, of challenges that uh, that we have identified for specifically um, telepresence video conference content. Well, first of all, there is a clear difference in terms of uh, structure of the content itself. Uh, in a content. Uh, the structure is very well defined. It's actually defined to the uh, to the extreme detail. Uh, you know, think about commercial, think about video, think, think about uh, you know TV uh, program. And so it's very rich, and this structure can be really used for the content analysis. This is not uh, necessarily true for uh, uh, teleconference, telepresence content. So this is a challenge. In, in terms of the analysis and also the presentation of, of the content. Imagine a, a video conference where the background is not changing when you have all the talking heads. The, the uh, uh, some content that that particular talking head uh, is giving may be limited unless you're able to extract the non-verbal uh, uh, information. Uh, this is you know, an, important, uh, an important aspect, uh, in fact, of, uh, of the information exchange during a, during a, a conference uh, in the uh, session. Um, same thing, you know, when we want uh, to be, uh, you know, on offline, of course, as Dave was mentioning, the capability of, uh, of having visual clues uh, from, uh, from the content uh, while they're clear uh, in uh, in entertainment content, the scenes are well defined and, and, and the contribution well defined. This is not uh, necessarily the case of uh, of uh, teleconference telepresence content. So so this is a challenge how to present uh, present this uh, this information. And and finally, I would say you know privacy and security because of course a, a teleconference session where uh, the new structure of of a given is asked, that probably doesn't need to be shared and, uh, and also you know, need to be controlled uh, uh, quite strictly. So there's not only the issue of protecting uh, the video audio material associated with that, but also uh, you know, who, ha who can have uh, access of this uh, uh, processed information that actually becomes much richer than, uh, you know, in, in terms of access than the, 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 the original one. Um, and finally, I would say for, you know, uh, the online case, uh, um, th there are some other uh, challenges, uh, you know, definitely the low latency, you know, the stream, the metadata stream need to be synchronized with, uh, uh, you know, with the video and, and the audio to be usable by all the uh, participants. Um, the algorithm uh, do not, uh, uh, you know, do not have the possibility of looking in the future, so you know, going back and forth. So these are algorithms that are single pass; they, they they can operate on the data they have, and that's about it. So they need to be really efficient uh, for that. And and of course, there is a limited amount of co of computing capability you can apply uh, for uh, a particular uh, context, so that uh, you know these services can scale uh, uh, properly. Okay, so uh, after this uh, uh, brief uh, brief overview, I would say um, we can uh, uh, move to uh, question and answers. And uh, actually, I have a few questions for our uh, participants. And uh, the first one is uh, uh, is for uh, for everyone. 
Uh, we talked about, uh, you know, metadata representation, uh, the, the importance. Uh, we, we talked about, uh, uh, you know, the role in, in entertainment content, the role in, in video conferencing. One thing that we, we have, we didn't have the time to discuss is uh, the streaming aspect. So metadata is becoming, at the end, uh, a real-time stream uh, that uh, need to be able to be synchronized with uh, media, video and, uh, and audio and used uh, you, you know, accordingly. Um, and I would ask all the, the uh, panelists maybe to, to briefly comment on uh, uh, what is the state of the art and what they, uh, they feel about, uh, you know, the, 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 this component of, of metadata. So the capability of being streamed and synchronized, uh, um, with, uh, with actually the media, media content. Uh, who, who, who want to start? Dave? I can say a couple of words. Um, because we've kind of tried to we've run into this problem uh, in terms of trying to deal with uh, streaming metadata um, and uh, you know there's those points that you mentioned in terms of processing and generation of the metadata um, there's always the issue of synchronization because most media processing algorithms need a buffer of maybe uh, at least a few frames if not a few seconds to operate and create the media of course the video coding and decoding has inherent uh, buffering delays as well. So in some cases, those things sort of cancel out and the metadata arrives at the same time. Um, and then there's the issue of transport and sort of format, uh, how that's represented. Um, you know, obviously we can put it into a streaming context, but uh, today uh, we're seeing a move toward HTTP for at least media delivery. Um, maybe not as much in the real time, but at least in uh, on demand where most of these uh, indexing applications have been in the past. Um, and so uh, also many of the representations of metadata are XML based, mm -hmm. which typically uh, requires a closing tag at the end. So the XML fragments have to be fairly you know, consistent. Uh, so it's difficult to decode those in a streaming manner. Uh, some of the solutions that we've done involve uh, basically getting updated fragments that are consistent um, with, you know, the sort of uh, syntactically valid XML documents, if you will, but they uh, represent only a certain amount of time from the beginning of the media presentation to the current time. And then if a client asks for the next content description, it may either repeat that uh, metadata, or with, but it actually will also include a more recently extracted uh, content description, and then that will be terminated. So each time the client may request it, you may get a you know, a slightly different representation of the content. So that's a sort of a workable solution, but probably not optimal. Um, but it works with today's uh, systems for parsing uh, XML and uh, delivering content through HTTP, for example. Um, so I, I'm interested right. to hear what others have right. to say. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, you know, in all the initiatives uh, in, uh, in EBU with respect to metadata, is uh, the streaming component uh, uh, something that uh, uh, is looked at? Uh, how, how you see this component position uh, in the overall activities? Uh, st streaming in general, of course, we, we are looking at that. Uh, streaming of content is important, in particular in the framework of different projects like um, HBB TV, which is hybrid broadcast uh, and broadband, when you want to uh, send content that is associated to the main broadcast stream. Uh, but my, my main comment would be about the fact that uh, when I look at all the activities in W3C and in the HTML group, I do not hear so much about uh, synchronized metadata. I hear a lot about time text and uh, subtitling, okay. and which could be used as a, as a mechanism to synchronize whatever you want to synchronize with content, with um, providing data in a, in a separate file. So that can provide a lot of solutions. But the only main application I hear about is subtitling. And I have not heard so much about the need for associated uh, synchronized metadata. And the, the, despite uh, despite this, uh, the, there is uh, you know all the um, secondary screens that are emerging, and mainly will be uh, the, the perfect environment for presenting enhanced metadata about the program. 
uh, that uh, I'm watching, for example, on my main screen, my 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 TV, and that will definitely require a synchronization between uh, between the two the two devices. Yeah, but not at the same level of granularity. So you, you, right, you exactly. mean so, you see? Yeah. yeah, there are many applications with a second screen where you have, for instance, uh, you have the mainstream broadcast, and then you have you, you have an icon somewhere that says if you press on the X button, then something is going to happen because something is available, and then that's going to trigger right. something. But that that that, that is right. not the same level of synchronization as what you need for, for instance, time text or if you wanted to tag events in a very precise manner. That's completely different. But of course, there are many people working on this right now. Second screen applications are key. People think it is a killer. Right. Not in fact, and in fact, actually, you know, raises a good point. Uh, there are two kind of synchronization. What we call a strict synchronization that relies really on timestamp is more toward the you know, an RTP uh, real time streaming protocol uh, synchronization where you know, you have the same time base. You can you can really reach uh, quite a bit of accuracy uh, between the, the metadata stream and the uh, audio and video stream. And instead, of uh, uh, much more relaxed, uh, uh, you know, non-tight. Uh, synchronization, where in fact you can use completely different uh, uh, technologies like web services, or you know, grab some metadata in advance, and then you know, synchronize this in some way to the receiver at the receiver end, uh, and also you know, in applications as Jean Pierre was mentioning, where the tight synchronization is not really an issue, so the tolerance or even uh, you know. Uh, a second or so is uh, is still acceptable for uh, you know, assuring a, a good quality uh, quality of service. Thank you, Jupiter. And the now I have a question for for Alberto. In fact, so uh, with respect to the AVDP um, uh, and and synchronization, how how Alberto you see these evolving? Um, well. Uh, this, this question has many aspects. Uh, well, first of all, maybe uh, regarding the, the specifically the AVDP, you know that MPEG-7 came also with a B-stream representation of the descriptor, so this right. could be a right. first a first look at, uh, a first look to have uh, in order to start understanding how to, to transmit data in a in a stream. But apart from this, uh, I see what I see very critical. Uh, together with what you were mentioning about the synchronization uh, of the uh, of the metadata uh, during basically the fruition of the content, uh, I, I see like a sort of uh, inherent limitation in the generation because uh, if streaming metadata is connected to generating metadata while the content is being uh, sent on air live, for example, there are some applications that are inherently limited. For example, think about all the applications that need to cluster content. So in principle, you cannot right. cluster content in a very efficient way if you don't have a, a buffer which is at least long as the content. So this is a very tough limitation for all those uh, uh, machineries that need uh, such a long buffer to be uh, to compute their metadata efficiently. Of course, there are uh, techniques that make a clustering uh, out of stream of data, but, uh, but these, of course, have, have a different performance. So what I see uh, as a critical point at the same level, at least, uh, of, uh, of the synchronization, synchronization of metadata in devices is the synchronization of metadata in generation. Yeah, especially when metadata are not uh, are not right. generated in advance, because when they are generated in advance, the problem is to ensure that metadata are synchronized in the stream. But when they're, these course, are not yeah. generated in advance, these are very big. It's a huge, huge, huge task. In my opinion, right? No, I, I agree one hundred percent. In fact, it was one of the things that we were mentioning in the uh, in the video conference telepresence space. But is also true for uh, for content. It is, and it's probably one of the areas where metadata will play, you know, a key role because it will, uh, you know, enhance the fruition uh, of the content of live content uh, right away. And so, uh, and so, you know, synchronization, uh, fruition of the metadata on the secondary surface, synchronization, the entire synchronization at this point will be very, very relevant, very relevant. 
Okay, uh, I think we are running out of time. So uh, I want to thank you all the panelists. It has been really a pleasure to, uh, uh, to, to, to have you here. Uh, the discussion has been really interesting. I think we covered uh, uh, several aspects of, uh, of the metadata uh, uh, topic and the activities that we have in, uh, in IMTC. Uh, I want to uh, remind to our audience, uh, this uh, webinar is uh, recorded and uh, you will find the recordings uh, um, just looking at the IMTC website, www.imtc.org, where you can ask to have uh, the contact information uh, if you're interested in learning more about the activity IMTC or joining uh, uh, IMTC. So uh, I want to thank you, uh, everyone, and uh, and with this uh, I want to um, uh, close with the, the, the webinar. So thank you, Jean Pierre. Uh, thank you, Alberto, and uh, thank you, Dave. Yeah, welcome. Um, talk next time. Thank you. Thank you very next much. Time. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.